and it's, it's, a, it's a great privilege. And I always think that the Irish audience is so much more engaged and uh, interested in these uh, questions of Britain and Europe than many of us are seriously interested uh, than many people back home are. So it is a real pleasure to be here. Um, uh, although um, I'm not going to speak in a Labour capacity today, um, uh, and I'm going to talk mainly about the, um, uh, the Conservatives' approach to Europe. Um, uh, we meet on a day after shock by-election results in Britain. I don't know how many of you followed that overnight, but uh, um, uh, these results demonstrate both in a, in a previously Conservative-held seat in Clacton and in a Labour-held seat in Haywood and Middleton in Lancashire uh, massive disillusion uh, on the part of the public with the established parties. There's no other uh, way that one can respond to that. Um, immigration is, is a huge issue on the ground, uh, and uh, people obviously feel that uh, the party, the main, the establishment parties aren't responding to that as they should. However, um, UKIP's success tells you very little. Uh, in my view, about the position on Europe uh, in Britain. Uh, and it also tells you very little about what's likely to happen at the next general election. Um, I'm assuming, um, for the purposes of this talk, uh, that uh, David Cameron uh, will remain Prime Minister after May. It's obviously not my wish. Um, uh, uh, I don't, but but I think it would be interesting to you uh, to work on the basis uh, that Cameron remains prime minister, um, uh, and that he has a majority in the House of Commons for his policy of a renegotiation of Britain's place in Europe, the terms of membership of Europe, a fundamental renegotiation, which he talks about, uh, followed by a referendum uh, in two thousand and seventeen. Um, what I want to do is to talk to you, first of all, about the political background to this pledge that he made. Uh, secondly, uh, to discuss the prospects for the success of such a renegotiation. And thirdly, to discuss um, uh, whether a referendum uh, on Europe could be won in Britain. So that's, that's basically what I'm going to talk about. On the political background... Uh, David Cameron never wanted to be in this position, as I'm sure many of you are aware. Uh, when he was elected leader of the Conservative Party in 2005, he, he urged the Conservative Party to stop banging on about Europe because he felt that this was not an issue uh, where the, which, in which the public were really interested, and as polling evidence all suggests that to be the case, uh, and not an, not an issue uh, which uh, gave the... Conservative Party, the kind of modern centrist image that he felt was essential uh, for them to win uh, a general election. Uh, so he never wanted this. Um, what brought it about uh, was the Conservative Party's reaction to the Euro crisis. When the Euro crisis broke, um, a lot of Conservatives whoopied They'd been proved right about the euro. It was an absolute disaster. Uh, and um, uh, the sooner the whole thing broke up, the better. That was the attitude. I could see it in the House of Lords, the Conservatives opposite. I could see it in the Commons. That was their basic instinct, that the sooner the whole thing collapsed, the better we'd all be. Now, George Osborne, to his great credit, uh, as Chancellor of the Exchequer, recognised that this would be a national disaster for Britain as much as for Europe. Uh, that uh, uh, the breakup of the euro, that, because, that Britain hadn't escaped, as it were, the problems of the euro by not being a member of it, and that the breakup of the euro would be a very, very difficult background to the huge fiscal consolidation he was uh, having to undertake uh, for domestic uh, UK purposes to get our economy right. And so he said to the Conservative Party, and it was very clever, I thought, sort of understandably at the time, he said, look, um, 
We, we can't afford the euro to fail. It's essential to us that they rescue the euro. But the only way that the euro can be rescued uh, is if there is uh, much more integration in the eurozone, of which Britain can never be part. And therefore, there is going to be in future a two-tier European Union with a much more tightly... Uh, uh, the inescapable logic, ineluctable logic, I can't remember his phrase now, of, of, of integration in the eurozone, uh, there is going to be inevitably a two-tier union, and this provides us, the British, with the opportunity you Conservatives have all been waiting for all these years uh, to go in there and say, yes, we want to stay part of a trading arrangement, we want to stay, we want to cooperate with you where we agree with you, uh, and only where we agree with you, um, but uh, this is an opportunity for a fundamental renegotiation of Britain's position in the European Union necessitated by the integration uh, that, uh, that would be forced by the Euro uh, crisis. Um, this was, of course, a, a, in, in British, terms of British foreign policy, a very significant statement. It's the first time since the Second World War, first time possibly ever, uh, that the British government had said that it was not prepared, that it was prepared to accept that it would not be a leading member of uh, Europe, right? That it was prepared to be a second-class citizen on the sidelines. So it was a very significant statement. Um, but that was the statement that was made, and that was the logic of this renegotiation argument. Now, it then emerged, of course, that the euro was going to be rescued without the fundamental treaty change, or at least without the fundamental treaty change in the short term uh, that George Osborne had, had, had envisaged uh, would be necessary. Um, but the Conservatives had stuck themselves with this renegotiation commitment. So in his Bloomberg speech, the Prime Minister switched the emphasis from... He still went on a bit about the inevitability of closer Eurozone integration and the need for some protections against discrimination by Euro-ins uh, against Euro-outs. He mentioned that. But he shifted the, the, the emphasis to a more broadly based reform agenda. And that was the speech that he made at Bloomberg in January two, 2013, which after he'd resisted for about a year the pressure uh, on the, from, from his backbenchers to commit to a referendum, he actually came out and said there... We'll have this renegotiation, and I, can, I pledge that by the end of 2017, we'll have an in-out uh, referendum. Um, but implicit in this reform agenda, which he was pitching, uh, was, uh, you know, quite a lot of high-level ideas that a lot of people uh, would have some sympathy with, like... Um, uh, a greater role for national parliaments in the, in the design of the union, the idea that powers can flow back to the member states as well as to the centre, a uh, flexibility of approach. Um, uh, the idea that uh, uh, we could do far more uh, to promote the single market, the idea that uh, we could, um, in Europe, that we could do far more to promote the single market. There was an agenda of economic reform that had to be achieved in order to do that. The idea that we could avoid unnecessary intrusive regulation. I thought this, this, the pitch of this speech was quite skillful, uh, and uh, it won support uh, in uh, a lot of Northern Europe. I found as I went round that quite a lot of Northern Europe were quite sympathetic uh, to what Cameron had to say. They weren't sympathetic to his 
concept of a renegotiation and a referendum, but they were sympathetic to the kind of objectives that he was setting uh, for change in the European Union. But since uh, Cameron made his Bloomberg speech in in January uh, last year, um, he thought that by making the speech, this would kill the Europe issue uh, between now and the 2015 general election. That was a gross miscalculation that was. And the principal reason it was a gross miscalculation uh, was because of the strength of UKIP. Now, UKIP actually doesn't win votes primarily on its anti-European position. It is, of course, wholly committed to British withdrawal from the European Union. And people do see some linkage between the European Union and the immigration issue, which is one of their main public uh, discontents. Um, uh, But it is much more about a general mood of dissatisfaction with the the political class of all kinds. And it's much more about an alienation of a specific section of the electorate, in particular... um, less well-educated, older, white working-class men uh, for whom globalisation hasn't worked, really, who who see themselves as having a declining and more insecure position in society. And there is a very, very sharp demographic about the UKIP support. Most of our political parties draw draw fairly evenly across the social range nowadays. Demographics are not a very good predictor of who supports Labour and who supports Conservative. Um, A lot of AB voters, uh, people who've been to university, now support the Labour Party. But in terms of UKIP, the social demographic is very clear uh, and very, very specific, and it's this group. But Conservative MPs interpret the threat of UKIP Uh, to their position in Parliament, and they interpret it, uh, they think that the way they deal with this threat is by toughening up their rhetoric on Europe. And that is what Cameron has done. So in the last month, we have had a considerable toughening up uh, of the rhetoric uh, and a more and a clearer pledge that he will do something about migration. So we're on a slide here. Uh, What started off as something to deal with the inexorable logic of the euro crisis uh, is now becoming something uh, which is about responding to massive populist discontent about immigration and trying to contain what is believed to be UKIP erosion of the Conservative Party position. How much further this will go and what will be said in the Conservative election manifesto, obviously you'll have to ask them, uh, but I fear the worst. Um, next point then. What are, if, assuming that, that Cameron has gets his renegotiation and is there to implement it, what are the prospects? Well, I think in some respects um, the prospects are quite good, um, Uh, For instance, a lot of his Bloomberg speech was about the need for economic reform. Well, there is actually a lot of economic reform going on in Europe. There are ambitious plans for extending the single market in the Juncker program that has been agreed by the European Council. Um, There is actually big economic reform taking place in the the member states. Uh, The Italian Senate yesterday voted through a path-breaking labour market reform in Italy, which no one else has succeeded in doing. This demonstrates that Renzi uh, should not be underestimated as, as an aside. He is, a, he is I think, a, a remarkable phenomenon. Uh, so there is economic reform uh, taking place. Um, there is also uh, acceptance, I think, that the, there is an issue about European regulation. Franz Timmermans, who's the deputy to Juncker, uh, is uh, obsessed, is perhaps a strong word, but he's certainly very concerned about how we introduce more proportionality and subsidiarity into the way that Europe uh, operates. 
And I think that everyone would like to see a stronger role for national parliaments. So in that respect, I think he could make quite a lot of progress on his reform agenda. But there are difficult, really difficult subjects, and there are three, I think. Um, first, uh, there's the question of, of migration. What, 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 what does Cameron actually want on migration? Secondly, there's this pledge that the Conservatives have made, which takes Britain pretty close to the exit of the European Convention on Human Rights, which is linked to our EU membership. And thirdly, there's the question of what treaty changes might be possible, because Cameron has not ruled out treaty changes. On migration, it is clear that some of the British concerns about migration are shared in other countries. I don't know what the position is in Ireland, but certainly in Germany, uh, there is major concern about uh, the so-called issue of benefit tourism uh, and benefits being claimed by Polish workers uh, for their families that are back in Poland. That is, that is certainly, and I think that it's possible that that might be addressed. I don't personally find this, uh, this discourse a very pleasant one, uh, but, uh, but I think that probably something uh, will be done about it. I think there's also clarification that uh, the, right, uh, the, the, the freedom of movement rights uh, actually apply to people who, are, who seek work, uh, not to people who don't seek work, and therefore, if they're not seeking work, um, they have no right uh, to stay uh, in your country. Now, that is a, uh, something I think that Cameron will be pressing for quite hard, whether this is compatible with the treaties or not. Uh, I, um, I don't know, but I think it is an issue in contention. But in his, in his conference speech, Cameron implied that he would do something about controlling numbers. Now, um, it is possible to control numbers uh, in the case of new member states, not that there are going to be any new member states in the next five years, but it is possible that you could have tougher transitional controls, that you could argue that as part of those transitional controls, the right of free movement wouldn't come into effect until, you know, they got to two-thirds of the GDP of the EU average or something like that. You know, so you could, you, could, you could insert those kind of provisions in new treaties of enlargement, but you can't insert those kind of provisions into the existing rights of members of the European Union. And I just don't know what uh, uh, the Prime Minister envisages on this score it may be that he doesn't envisage very much. It may be that he hasn't understood the issue. Uh, 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 and, um, but I think that it is quite a serious commitment, an error that he has made. Secondly, on the European Convention on Human Rights, um, this, is quite, this is a highly technical legal subject. But the idea that Britain could withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights, which, of course, Britain was one of the leading founder member states in the, in the late 1940s, uh, the idea that we could withdraw from this and that people in the EU would say, oh, that's fine, I think, is, um, I think it would raise lots of difficulties uh, about the fact that the EU is committed to the convention principles um, uh, in its own right. And then there's the question of treaty change. Now, there is one treaty change which I think is perfectly doable, which is and uh, do doable without generating referenda in other countries, possibly, <laughs> possibly in Ireland, but not, but but <laughs> but, uh, but certainly not anywhere else. I think you could do a treaty change which, which which strengthened the principle of non-discrimination uh, by euro-ins against euro-outs in relation to the single market. I think that probably could be done. And I know there have been discussions with the Germans about this. But the other things that Cameron probably wants are more tricky. 
the Conservative Party would love some kind of opt-out from social legislation, in other words, a a return to the opt-out of the social charter, I think it would be extremely difficult to persuade the French president to agree to any such measure, which he would regard as Britain uh, attaining an unfair competitive advantage over France. So I think that that is extremely difficult. And then there is the Cameron's specific demand for an opt-out from the ever closer union preamble uh, of the treaty. Now, I think that I am sceptical about whether this has any legal value or substance of any kind, one way or the other. Uh, But I can see that people in the EU might get very upset about it. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, And he has made this one of his bottom line points that he wants to achieve. I'd be interested in others' views. My impression of our partners is that Germany is very keen to keep Britain in the EU. I actually think France is very keen to keep Britain in the EU as well because of of security reasons. Um, The commission, the new commission, is obviously very keen to keep Britain in the EU. But I think there is a certain amount of indifference among other members who are just fed up with the British, frankly. Um, And I think that it will be interesting to see how much... Uh, of a uh, a response from other member states um, the British demands get if they're put after May 2015. Then there's my final point about the referendum itself. Could a referendum be won, assuming that Cameron can negotiate a set of terms which he's prepared to put and recommend to the British people? Um, I think that on this, the British public opinion is not the fundamental problem. It's not the fundamental problem. If you look at British public opinion, 15 to 20% generally are in favour of the European Union. 35 to 40% are extremely hostile and would vote to withdraw. So you have a third, at least, of the voters who would vote to withdraw in any circumstances. Um, a lot of those, of course, would be people who vote for UKIP in elections. But, uh, um, but there, is a, there, is, there is definitely a, a substantial number who will are against staying in. But the other 40%, the other 40% is sceptic about Europe, not enthusiastic about Europe, but open to persuasion. And polling that has been done suggests that if the Prime Minister, supported by the Labour leader and the Liberal Democrat leader, uh, recommended a set of terms, that they might well be able to win a referendum. That polling, uh, Peter Kellner of YouGov has uh, written a paper about demonstrating that this uh, is, in his view, perfectly possible. So the public opinion, the key section of public opinion, is sceptic, but malleable, is how I would put it. Skeptic, but persuadable. Um, The real problem about this political problem, about this whole exercise, is the Conservative Party. It's It's a very Conservative Party problem. There are a lot of Conservative MPs who say... Yes, I would like to stay. I would like Britain to stay in the European Union if we have a successful renegotiation. My problem with them is that their terms, what they mean by a successful renegotiation, are wholly unachievable. Because what they mean by a successful renegotiation is, an, is, is, is turning the EU into an arrangement where British membership is essentially about free trade uh, and there is political cooperation between the member states, of course, operating on the unanimity uh, principle. I don't think that model of trade and cooperation is an acceptable within the EU framework. I can't see any of our partners agreeing to a British membership on that uh, basis. It's also the case that 
most conservatives fail to understand that the single market is much more complex than a straightforward free trade area. It's in fact a whole body of regulation um, uh, which requires uh, an independent supranational commission and court to supervise it uh, and make it work. Um, and yet they find that supranationalism extremely difficult to cope with. So there are fundamental problems in attitudes about what, they, what is achievable. I also think that it will not be possible uh, for David Cameron to meet the expectations that he has himself generated on the question of migration. I just do not think that the outcome of the negotiation will be that we can prevent Poles coming to work in Britain. Because, but that is what a lot of voters and Conservative Party members will think uh, that he's talking about. So the question is, is given that the renegotiation won't satisfy quite a lot of Conservatives... Uh, and given that there is a section of the Conservative Party that wants to pull Britain out of the European Union in any circumstances, and given that the UKIP idea, the UKIP threat is not likely to be a flash in the pan, but something that continues after the next election, would David Cameron actually be prepared to put to the British people a set of terms of renegotiation uh, that would in all likelihood split his own party. Now, Harold Wilson got away with that in 1975. He got in away with an agreement to differ within the Labour Party. Can, is it doable within the Conservative Party? I think that there is a fundamental tension in the Conservative Party uh, between, on the one hand, the interests of the wealth creators, if you how they would self-describe themselves, as it were, the wealth creators who uh, want, who recognise the necessity of Britain remaining part of Europe and its single market, uh, in the vast majority of cases. I mean, something like seventy percent, eight percent of city opinion, for instance, takes that view. Um, the CBI reckons that three-quarters of British business takes that view. So there obviously are dissenters, but the, the vast majority of the wealth-creating class, uh, which has been traditionally the conservative constituency in the country, wants Britain for it recognises that Britain has to stay. And the tension, therefore, between the wealth creators on the one hand and the populists on the other who want to pursue a kind of English nationalist agenda uh, which has control of immigration uh, as its number one uh, priority. Um, David Cameron is a sort of traditional conservative of a very pragmatic uh, frame of mind, in my opinion. I personally believe he, is, he would like to, Britain to stay a member of the European Union. I don't doubt his commitment to that. Um, but he is also a, 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 a person who, ten, I think, comes from a tradition, anyway, but let's put it like this, comes from a tradition that believes that the best interests of the country are served by keeping the Conservative Party in power, and keeping the Conservative Party in power means keeping it united. So this question of whether on Europe he is prepared to risk what I think would be a very damaging split and possibly a major realignment of British politics if UKIP remains a, um, a significant factor after the next election, which I think it will. I think these are deeply problematic political questions, which is why I am pessimistic about the prospects of this renegotiation and referendum. Uh, if the Conservatives win the next general election, and why from, as a pro-European, I fervently hope that uh, next year Ed Miliband will become Prime Minister. Thank you. <laughs>